Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Psych 3530. Uh, in this video, we will be going over the process and correct answers for the two practice problems that were at the end of the dependent t-test math and theory lecture. So these are the practice problems at the end of the dependent t-test math and theory lecture. We'll go through the first one um, in lots of detail, just like last time. And then uh, the second one, we'll go through a little bit more quickly um, just because all the steps are the same. Uh, and I'll point out anything that needs to be pointed out as different. So here's our first question. The owner of a CrossFit gym wants to see if six months of CrossFit lowers people's percent body fat. They measure body fat percentage of 12 people before they start CrossFit, and then six months after uh, having done CrossFit. We're going to assume an alpha of 0.01. What do we conclude? So here are our data. We see uh, before and after CrossFit percent body fat. And the way that um, dependent t-test sort of data tables are set up is such that obviously the data uh, from this person on this first row uh, of before CrossFit carries over and this 17 is the same person, right? So we're following people over time, right? Across six months. So this person who's 22 became 17. This person who's 15 became 18. This person who was 16 became 11, so on and so forth. Here are our steps laid out to conducting this dependent t-test. We're going to define our populations and hypotheses, calculate a change score, Use that change score to calculate sum of squares, variance, standard deviation, calculate uh, variance, standard error, t-value, critical t-value, make a decision about rejecting or failing to reject the null. And then if we're significant, if we reject the null, we'll need to do an effect size and then write up our APA style conclusion. So the first thing we want to do is take these data and put them into, oh, I'm sorry. The first thing we want to do is define our populations and hypotheses. So um, population one, even though we're talking about the same people um, over time, the population one is you can think of as being people before they do CrossFit. Population two is people after they do CrossFit. Our research hypothesis is that before doing CrossFit, so population one, people will have a greater percentage of body fat than after CrossFit, population two. And so our null hypothesis is everything else, right? Less than or equal to. Now you could reframe this and put population two first, and then your research hypothesis would be less than population one. It technically doesn't really matter, but just for the sake of keeping things consistent, just stick with population one first versus population two, and then make your decision about your inequalities. So will people before CrossFit have greater amounts of body fat than people after CrossFit, right? That's the same thing as CrossFit decreasing body fat. Now we want to set up our change score because we're not actually comparing like we're not doing math with these numbers. We're going to be doing math with each person's change score or difference score. So what we want to do here is actually set this up as after minus before. The math will work if you do before minus after, but there's a reason that we want to do after minus before. And that reason is that our different score or change score, its sign will reflect the direction of true change. So let's see what that looks like. We take individual one, they were 17 before minus, or 17 after minus 22 before. So their change score is minus five. 14 minus 18 is negative four. 18 minus 15 is positive three, so on and so forth keep these signs, they are important. Notice that if an individual like this first person loses body fat, right? Before they were 22, 
after they were 17, which means they lost body fat over time, then they end up with a negative change score. That's what we want because they lost body fat. If you did before minus after, they would have a positive change score. And so it's just a little more intuitive if we do after minus before, such that the sign of this number reflects the true nature of change. So let's look at our person who actually managed to gain body fat when they were doing CrossFit, right? Before CrossFit, they had 15% body fat. After CrossFit, they had 18% body fat. They actually put on fat. And so they have a positive score, which differs from everyone else, right? Everyone else actually lowered their body fat. So we just want to keep these signs and we want these signs to reflect the true nature of change. So that's why we do after minus before. Okay, so now we take those different scores and that's what we're going to use to calculate our t-test. So we find our average change score, our average difference score, and it happens to have a mean of negative 3.67. And then we just do our sum of squares thing. We subtract the different score minus the mean, and then we square it. Keep in mind your signs, right? This is negative five minus negative 3.67. What happens when you subtract a negative? You end up adding, right? So negative five minus negative 3.67 is negative 1.33, so on and so forth. Then we square to get our, and then we add them all up to get our sum of squares. I'll give you a minute. Maybe go ahead and press pause, check your math, uh, and keep in mind that we are rounding to two decimal points for every calculation here. So if you're, again, a touch off on this sum of squares, that's okay. If you've got 100.67, 100.66, 100.65, you're going to be fine. That little difference is going to wash out once we start doing other calculations. So go ahead and press pause, check your math and then press play when you're ready to go. All right, so we have our sum of squares. Now we want to find our variance and standard deviation of the population. So variance S squared is just sum of squares divided by N minus one. We pull our sum of squares from that table, 100.68, divide by N is the number of participants, so 12. Don't get this confused with thinking, I'm going to come back to the beginning here, thinking that we have 24 people, right? We started with 24 data points because I have two data points per person. N is the number of participants, not the number of data points. So here N is 12 because I had 12 people. So 12 minus 1 is going to be 11. So 100.68 divided by 11 gives us a variance in S squared of 9.15. We can go ahead and calculate our standard deviation, which you'll see called SD or just S. And it's just the square root of our variance, right? If it's S, then we just take the square root of S squared to get S. So we take the square root of 9.15 to give us 3.02. Now, we're not going to carry this value forward quite yet, but we will need it if we calculate an effect size. And then, of course, we have to report the standard deviation in our APA style conclusion. So now we need to calculate the denominator for our t-test. It's called the standard error of the mean. Uh, again, you can think about this as um, the average amount of random variability that there will be in people's um, body fat percentage. Because uh, over time, across six months, people's body fat is just going to change naturally to some extent, some people more than others. Um, so we need to know, did CrossFit change body fat more than we would expect body fat to just kind of randomly, naturally uh, change or fluctuate or uh, what we call have error right over time. So we're going to bring over our variance, our 9.15, right, our S squared, and we're going to divide our S squared by N, by 12, to give us 0.76. Then we take 
0.76 and we move it up here and we take its square root. The square root of 0.76 is 0.87. And this guy, S sub M, what we can call the standard error of the mean, this becomes our denominator of our t-test. So here on the left is our T value. Or I'm sorry, here on the left is the formula to get our T value. Uh, M is going to be our mean difference score. So this guy right here, negative 3.67. Minus mu. Um, mu is zero every time we calculate a dependent t-test. Because remember, what we're doing is, is comparing m, which is the amount of change, the amount of difference score from our after minus before, the amount of difference that CrossFit made compared to the idea of zero change, right? The idea of zero difference, because that's what our basically our null hypothesis is here is that CrossFit wouldn't do anything that after minus before would equal zero because there was no change in body body um, fat percentage. So we're comparing our observed change, in this case, a decrease of negative three, a decrease of 3.67 uh, body fat percentages. We're comparing that to the idea of no change. Because we're asking, did CrossFit change body fat more than if nothing happened, divide by the standard error of the mean, this guy right here, 0.87. And we get a T value of negative 4.22. The negative is important. Keep that sign. Now we need to know what's our critical T value. We had 11 degrees of freedom because N was 12. Alpha was 0.01, and we had a one-tailed test. So we're working off of the 11 degrees of freedom row. We had a one-tailed test with alpha of 0.01. So our critical T value is 2.718. But we have to know that it's actually negative 2.718 because we made a negative one-directional hypothesis that uh, that body fat would decrease over time. So now we need to make a decision about rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis. Our benchmark is negative 2.718. Our observed, our calculated T value is negative 4.22. So we are more extreme than our benchmark. We have crossed over our threshold we are extreme enough to be convincing. It would be, it is exceedingly rare, right? We're even, we're way off the curve here with a T of 4.22. It would be exceedingly rare for this observation to occur by chance. So we reject the null and we support the idea that CrossFit does in fact reduce body fat percentage. So now that we know we've rejected the null, we calculate an effect size. Uh, our, the denominator of Cohen's D is the same, M minus mu, so negative 3.67 minus zero, divided by S, that's our standard deviation that we calculated way back when with our sum of squares table. So we bring that guy back, 3.02, negative 3.67 divided by 3.02, 1.22. Again, we can drop the negative on Cohen's D because Cohen's D is a measurement of size, not a measurement of directionality. So that negative doesn't actually matter. We just want to interpret the absolute value of Cohen's D. And this Cohen's D means that we have a large effect. Anything over 0.8 is considered large. So finally, our APA style conclusion. A dependent t-test was conducted to determine if people decrease their body fat after six months of CrossFit. State your test, state 
your research question. After six months, participants lost on average 3.67 body fat percentage points, mean negative 3.67, standard deviation equals 3.02. So there we, um, we display our descriptive statistics for our participants. We reject the null. People lost a significant amount of body fat across six months. T with degrees of freedom of 11 equals negative 4.22. P is less than 0.01. D equals 1.22 one-tailed. So that's T because we have a T test. 11 degrees of freedom. Our observed T value of negative 4.22. P was less than alpha, which was 0.01. And we report our Cohen's D. And we tell everyone that we did a one-tailed test. Thus, CrossFit reduces body fat percentage. Okay, let's look at example number two. Again, I'm going to go through this a little more quickly uh, because all the steps are exactly the same. Uh, feel free to pause at any point and check your math. So you work for a children's toy maker, and they want to understand how preference for toys changes over time. And you're specifically looking at preference for Pokemon. So maybe you, ha you have kids, you have 10 children. Uh, rate their enjoyment of poke Pokemon when they're eight years old. And then you have the same kids come back. Remember, the same kids. This is over time. That's what's making this a dependent t-test. We're sampling the same people repeatedly. The same kids come back at age 11, and they provide a rating of uh, their enjoyment of Pokemon. If alpha equals 0.05, what should we conclude? So remember, we need a dependent t-test here. And we're going to follow all these steps. Populations and hypotheses. Population 1 is children age 8. Population 2 is children age 11. Notice that we have a non-directional hypothesis because we want to know if toy preference changes over time. We don't know which way it's going to go. We're not sure if uh, from the age ages of 8 to 11 if kids are going to like Pokemon more or if kids are gonna like Pokemon less. We're not sure. So our research hypothesis is that it, it changes, right? That that preference for Pokemon changes over time, They're, that POP2 and POP1 are not equal. And the null hypothesis is of course that they are equal, that nothing has happened. So we again wanna set up with after minus before. Here, in, in this case, what is after? After is 11 years old. Before is 8 years old. We set up our data. We find our different scores. Notice now how our positive values reflect an increase in liking Pokemon over time. Right, This person increased by 2. This person increased by 1. And now our negative values represent a decrease in preference for Pokemon over time. So go ahead and hit pause, check your math here. All we did was find the mean of our change or difference score, subtract uh, x minus that mean, and then square them, and then add it all up to get 14.40 for our sum of squares. Press pause, check your math if needed. Remember, rounding to, do, to two decimal points. Uh, these all end up with zeros at the end. Sorry that they're not there. Uh, Excel just dropped them, I guess. Okay, so now that we've got our sum of squares, we can find our variance and standard deviation. Plug and chug, we take that sum, sum of squares, 14.40, divide by n minus 1. n was 10 because we had 10 participants. So 14.4 divided by 9 is, gives me a variance of 1.6. I take its square root to give me 1.26. That's my standard deviation. Again, we'll need this to calculate an effect size if we need an effect size and then we'll need it for our AP style conclusion. But as we move forward to calculate the standard error of the mean, we use this value, this variance. So we pull that variance forward. 1.60 divided by n, which was 10, gives me 0.16. We carry this over. The square root of 0.16 is 0 0.40. That's our standard error of the mean, and that's the denominator of our dependent t-test.
So now we have our change score, 1.4 minus mu, which is always zero, divided by the standard error of the mean, 0.4. It gives us a T value of 3.5. We find our critical value. We had nine degrees of freedom, so we're working on this row. Two-tailed test, right, because we're non-directional with an alpha of 0.05 gives me critical T values of plus or minus 2.262. Remember, plus or minus because I get one on either side. I get a negative critical value and a positive critical value because I'm doing a bi-directional, a two-tailed test. I didn't know which way it was, it's going to go. So we plot our two critical values. We bring back our observed T, which was 3.50. And we can clearly see that again, we're going to reject the null because our children that we followed increased their preference or enjoyment of Pokemon beyond our threshold, our critical value. We're gonna reject the idea that eight-year-olds and 11-year-olds equivalently like Pokemon and we're going to support the idea that they are not equal to one another. There was enough change from eight to 11 to put us past this critical value. And thus we're gonna conclude that Pokemon preference increases across whatever, middle childhood or with age. We're significant, so we need a Cohen's D again. Numerator is the same as the t-test, m minus mu divided by that Standard deviation from before, 1.26, gives us another large or robust effect with a D of 1.11. APA style conclusion, a dependent t-test was conducted to determine if preference of Pokemon changes as children age from 8 to 11. Across three years, these participants increased their liking of Pokemon by on average 1.4 points, mean equals 1.4, standard deviation equals 1.26. We reject the null. Children significantly increase in their liking of Pokemon from age 8 to 11. T with our 9 degrees of freedom, with our observed T value of 3.50. P was less than alpha, 0.05. D equals 1.11. We had a two-tailed test. Thus, as children age, their liking of Pokemon increases. That's it for our dependent t-test practice problems. Um, thanks for listening, and I will see you next, or I will talk to you next time.